I built this rocket mass heater on my back porch, but it only works to heat the porch if you enclose the porch, so I built these custom sliding screen doors. They both have big screen panels, and they have these clear vinyl sheets that you can hang up so that every winter you can actually trap the heat inside. Let me show you how I did it. Welcome back to Suburban Biology. My name is Kit. I am your humble host. This is a rocket mass heater. I made an entire video dedicated on how I built it, what it is, how it works, etc. In that video, many people asked me, why am I building a heater to heat the great outdoors? That makes no sense. You folks are exactly correct. My plan is not to heat the great outdoors. My plan is to heat my porch, someday a greenhouse, which connects here. And then if I open that door behind me, someday even heat my house using said heater. So I cover the whole porch renovation video in a separate video. I wanted to get real granular. This video, we're gonna cover these sliding doors that I'm gonna build right here, custom from scratch using stock steel. I just figured if anybody wants to walk in my footsteps, I'd show a little more detail on exactly how I'm gonna do that. So enjoy. So this giant piece of steel here is meant to serve as the bottom track of what will become the tracks for the sliding doors. The first thing you want to do when you're about to drill a hole in something like this is use a center punch to mark a little divot and that little divot helps guide the drill bit so that it goes straight through the hole and dead center of where you want it. These are the concrete fasteners I plan on using and this thing in my left hand is called an annular drill bit. It's a very efficient way of drilling out steel where you don't have to actually drill out all the steel, you just technically cut a ring through it. Here you see me tightening the annular drill bit into what's called a mag drill. This thing has an electromagnet in the base and you turn it on and it helps suck it down to whatever piece you're working on. You can see that little point in the center of the drill bit. I'm lining that up with the center punch divot that I made just a moment ago. And the smoke is coming from what's called cutting fluid. You just put a special type of fluid into a little groove in the side of the spinning part and that actually drains down and cools the bit off as you cut. Now I have my holes drilled on both sides. The next part of the job is laying the lower track beam down in place and then you got to make sure it's level and then you got to mark the slab where you want to put the concrete fasteners into it. I'm using what's called an air shim. It's a little hand pump that you see me filling up right now. That helps level things. You can buy those at home improvement stores. As you can see, I tend to use it in a way where I kind of use it like a jack to jack things up. And then once it's at the right height, I just put some cheapo door shims underneath it to hold it permanently in place. Here I'm making a marker that is going to be able to pass through that hole because most markers aren't really long enough to pass through a hole and mark through another hole in the back of the beam. That'll make more sense in a second here. But I'm just showing how you can take a kind of liquid ink marker that you can just buy on online, Amazon, whatever. And then I use a piece of PEX here to make it kind of like an extension. And then I hold them together and that's what I use uh, in several different parts of this job uh, just to act like an elongated marker. And as promised, there's the action shot. So that's passing through the hole in the back of the beam and I'm wiggling it around as accurately as I possibly can so that I'm marking a big black dot on the cement slab on the back side after passing through both holes in that beam. And it's time to get the beam out of the way and start drilling holes. These are the concrete fasteners I use. I have no brand loyalty. I just figured I'd show any engineering nerds out there that I did my best to use something strong. This type of fastener has a flared end you can see here and then a threaded end of the shaft is the other side and when you tighten the nut down that flared end goes sinking in and those leaves spread apart and expand in the cement and that's what holds this outer sleeve in place. 
and so these are what I use to hold the lower beam in place. It requires that you drill a hole in the slab using a cement bit, and this is my good old handy hammer drill. Here I'm marking the bit to make sure that I go in deep enough. If you don't go in deep enough, later on when you try and hammer in those concrete fasteners, they bottom out too quick and they don't wind up doing their job. You got this big old threaded shaft sticking out way further than you need. This isn't the prettiest starting job you see me doing here. I'm kind of dancing around, but you can see it's a super uneven surface and sometimes you really got to do that. You got to kind of make a divot before you can get the drill to seat into it and really go to town on it. And I repeat the same process over and over for each of the holes, every place that there needs to be a fastener. At this point, I hit a little piece of rebar. You can hear the difference when you hit rebar. The drill kind of makes a clicking sound. So this is called a rebar cutter. It's a special type of bit. As you can see, it has cutting teeth on the surface of the bit. Those are meant to cut steel only. You got to make sure you remember to put your hammer drill back to just plain old drill setting. You don't want a hammer because those teeth will crack off. And it works pretty much like any other standard drill bit would. And once you cut the steel rebar out of your way, you put your cement bit or your masonry bit back in place, click back to hammer mode, and go to town. And you can hear the difference now. There's not that weird clicking as the drill comes to a halt. The masonry bit's able to go through once you get the rebar out of the way. Here I'm just using an air compressor and a little piece of vinyl hose to blow out the dust from each hole. You're supposed to do this because if you leave the dust in place, it can actually mound up and prevent the concrete fastener from sinking deep into the hole like it's designed to do, and that will actually prevent the fastener from working properly. So you're supposed to blow the holes out, and I'm just too lazy to want to use a straw. Anybody who watched my previous video on how I repaired the corner of this porch over there will know that the people that poured the slab weren't exactly doing their best work. This is just further evidence of a similar crime. The gap over here is almost non-existent, but the further this way we go, look at that. That's about a two inch gap. The steel is machined nice and straight, so I trust that it is actually straight. And then it almost touches over there again. But yeah, so I'm gonna have to figure out something clever to close this gap because the whole concept of me bolting this into the side of the slab is that I need the edge of the steel closest to the cement to actually touch it in order to prevent this tube from rolling when I bolt it in. So I'm probably gonna have to get real creative, bolt it in place kind of uh, loosely, and then probably even gonna have to drill in some concrete anchors here and then tack weld a small piece of steel across it to act as a support mesh. And then I think I'm gonna pour cement into that gap when the steel beam is not yet tightly bolted and then once the cement dries then I can go to town and crank down on the bolts to get that beam to pull up nice and tight against the slab. These are the cement fasteners I decided to use. Again I'm using these just to act as a little bit of a reinforcement that will hold this uh, cement product that I'm about to put in here. I want it held into the old slab so there's not this big plane between the two where they'll just shear apart if there's any stress. So just use my same hammer drill, put these smaller cement fasteners in place, and then tap them in. And then I put the beam back in place, and I went ahead and put the big fasteners through the beam to actually hold the beam about where it's going to live forever. Here I'm using a brass drift pin to pound in the fasteners.
This is just an old piece of shelving that I'm using. I'm just setting them on top of the smaller concrete fasteners. I cut it to pieces and then I tack welded it to some little tiny concrete fasteners. That way I'm about to fill this gap with some cementitious product. I think that's the word, cementitious. Someone correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Um, I'm gonna make something called uh, basically mortar. I'm gonna use sand and Portland cement. The ratios we're gonna be using are three parts sand to one part Portland cement. And the Portland cement is basically just the binder that is in concrete products normally. So I'm gonna mix that up to a nice somewhat fluid consistency. And then I'm gonna pour it into that gap. The reasoning I'm using is that I want something that resists compressive force as well. So I'm gonna fill that gap with cement and hopefully my little quasi rebar structures here will help hold the new mortar in place if I ever were to take that beam down. Uh, it's not like the whole concrete shim will fall apart or anything like that. This little guy should look familiar to anybody who also watched the rocket mass heater video. And if you haven't, I strongly urge you to check that out. Probably the most successful video I'll ever make is my guess. One, two, So that's three gallons. Forgive me for using SAE units or whatever they're called. I'm a hopeless American. I know the metric system makes more sense, I'm aware. Like I said, I want the consistency a little bit on the runny side so I can pour it. Ooh, that might be too runny. So I previously kicked some of the loose dirt up against the outside of this beam to hopefully dam it up should the worst happen and my mortar attempts to flow out from underneath. I suppose that wouldn't be the worst. It would be one of many failure modes. The worst would probably involve an explosion or fire. They make a tool called a concrete vibrator, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a giant vibrator. I own one, believe it or not, but it's actually the girth of the rod of that thing is probably, I don't know, two inches, so it wouldn't fit into this gap. Anybody who has a better idea of how I might do this in the future, feel free to leave comments below. This was the best I could come up with. I figure whatever substance I'm putting in here should be able to resist compressive forces very well. That's really the main priority. Concrete's very good at that. And I didn't go with quickcrete because I didn't want to worry about the gravel being too lumpy. I wanted it to flow down into this narrow space. I was worried gravel might not flow as well. This, what I'm doing with my finger here, a little finger dance, this is the best simulation I can think up for what a concrete vibrator would normally do if I was doing this all professional-like. I did not tighten down the nut on these concrete fasteners yet because I, like I said, I didn't want to bow the steel to the misformed shape of my slab. So I didn't want to tighten things together just yet. I wanted to put this spacer of mortar in first before I tighten down the nuts. That way I wouldn't bow or deform the steel piece. All right, I'm back with my buffet of trowels. Back by popular demand, my Japanese finishing trowel. You'll have no idea how many heckling comments I got for using this to finish the rocket mass heater. I don't blame you. It's itty and bitty. But it makes my hands look big and manly. And isn't that what life's about? So here we are three days later. The grout is somewhat cured. I'm gonna try and give it as long as possible before I torque down those fasteners. I assume most of you know what this is, but this is called a torque wrench. You can hear a click sound when you hit the designated torque level. 
and that's how you know you have it torqued to the setting that you wanted. Next, I'm gonna attack making the, the, there's a lower track here. I'm gonna make an upper track and bolt it to that beam. As you can see, the support for that beam is flush with the upper beam right here. There's no gap, but down low, there's about an inch gap between the beam and the track, which means if I use the same size piece of steel, if I bolt one just like it up top, the doors will be leaning in by about an inch. So to compensate for that, I'm gonna weld two pieces of steel to each other. This is a four inch tube. This is a three inch tube. They don't make like a five inch tube that's readily available. This is what I could find at my steel yard. So I'm gonna weld those to each other to basically make a custom uh, deeper beam. That way the doors will be truly uh, plumb instead of leaning back by an inch at the top. And here I'm just marking the spot where the two beams will meet each other, just so I have a reference point. Because of the way the beams align with each other, I couldn't really drill any holes outside of this little band where you see me lining up the lag screw. So the name of the game was drilling a hole big enough for a socket to pass through that little top part of the beam, again using an annular drill bit, and that is the size of the bit I use based on the size of the socket that has to pass through it. Later on you'll see how the fact that it's such a tight clearance between the bit and this narrow piece that I have to drill through that actually leads to the lag screw catching a little bit. I'll explain that more in detail later though. So as you can see, now the socket passes through so I can use a ratchet wrench to eventually fasten my lag screws in. And I size the annular bit on the other side based on the size of the lag screw shaft, the threaded part that is. And it has to be small enough so the head won't fall through. And there you see the head doesn't fall through the back. Now with my holes drilled, it's time to weld these together to make them into one big beam. And I give you a shot right here of how well aligned the big hole and the small hole are with each other. All right, so now the upper beam is done. I got everything welded together. I got it as straight as I could because on this surface is where the angle iron is going. And then I got my holes drilled. The front one's big enough for a socket to get through there. And the back one is tiny enough so my lag screw head does not pass through it. And I'm gonna lift the top beam in place and then drill some holes. And I'll be passing lag screws through the top beam to hold it into this giant cedar beam here. And the name of the game here is to make sure, even if the bottom beam isn't true level and perfectly level, you really want the distance between the bottom beam and the top beam to be consistent the whole way because the doors are going to be sandwiched between those two beams. And if the beams were to drift apart and then get tighter together over the course of the door traveling, the door would either be pinched or be falling out of place. Only after recording this and reviewing the footage do I realize how horribly dangerous this is. And yeah, it just looks dangerous. So please don't do this. Do not do this. You'll see. I came up with a much safer way, but I just wanted to show you, uh, yeah, how it started and exactly why you shouldn't do it. You'll see. That's way heavier than it looks. And prepare for catastrophe. Yeah. By grace alone did this beam not go all the way to the ground. Almost ripped my downspout off, so I learned. So I spent far too long attempting to tackle this problem of getting this beam up onto that big cedar beam. I have a new idea. I think this is gonna be the safest approach overall. If I put an eye hook in here, way at the top of the cedar beam, and if I weld another hook right here, balanced on the center of the steel beam, I can run a strap between the two and cinch it up bit by bit. 
And if I do three of those, one dead center, one on that far end there, and then one on the other far end behind the camera, that should cover everything. So I'm gonna try that now, see if I can avoid hurting myself seriously. I'm gonna weld this in place, and then I'll pass the strap between this loop and that loop. I'm gonna do one, like I said, in the center, and then one on each end, and that'll help me hoist this up into place in a much safer manner than all the crazy stuff I was trying previously. All right. One of three done. So I officially have the lower track in place as y'all saw earlier. And now I have the upper track in place as well. I did my best to weld the loops onto the beam at the balance point so this thing wouldn't be rolling and then I as y'all saw, put the eye screw into the giant cedar beam and the strap is holding it at three points now. I have one of these set up at either end and one dead center. I got it relatively level. I'd say it's fairly good. And I went around measuring the gap between the upper track and lower track and it is exactly 92 and a quarter inches at all points that I measured all along the track, which is good. So now that I have that done, I'm gonna put some anti-vermin caps on the ends of the upper track tubes. I don't want critters living in there. They look like this. Little fins on the end help hold them in place and it's just a plastic cap. Goes on the ends of tubes and that helps prevent birds or rats or squirrels from living in your tubes. Off screen, I went ahead and used a plumb bob so that's gonna be the center of the angle iron. Uh, so now that I know where all of my angle iron needs to be welded, it's time to one, weld it to the lower track, and two, lower the upper track with the straps, flip it over, and then weld the angle irons in place. And then while that upper track is lowered down on the straps and while I'm welding, I'm gonna get out an auger bit and my drill, I'm gonna drill the holes where the wag screws are gonna go up top. So I'm not sure it's as intuitive as I assume it is to everyone in the audience, but when you use a V-notch wheel to build something, you usually use just plain normal angle iron, which has an L-shaped cross section, and then you tip it so that it has an A, or if upside down, a V-shaped cross section. That's why they're called V-notch wheels. So the angle iron serves as a track, and you have it uh, on the bottom track and the upper track, same size angle iron. And you can hear that noise there, it sounds gravelly, so I had to make sure I clean up these angle irons after I spouted that weld all over them. Much smoother sound there. And so here I just wanted to prove that with my new strap system, I'm able to lower this beam. I turned this into a safe one-man job rather than a life-threatening one-man job. These are jack stands. I think I got them at Harbor Freight, but you can get them any number of places. And I discovered after doing this a number of times, they really weren't necessary. It's just after dropping the entire beam, I was a little bit paranoid at first. And then once I had the beam down to a safe carrying level or height, I was able to just loosen the last center strap that I had it balanced on and then lift it out of place by myself.
And so this is the bottom of the upper track. And so I'm cleaning it up to prepare it for the angle iron to be welded in place. And like I said in the earlier scene, I'm not sure if that made sense, but I had already used a plumb bob off screen to find the exact points so that the upper angle iron and lower angle iron are perfectly aligned up to down. So one of them is right over the other one. That way the doors will ride nice and plumb. And after welding the angle irons in place, just like on the bottom track, on this upper track, I had to grind off the spatter and brush wheel it off just to clean it up. Here I size my drill bit to the lag screw. And then I use an auger bit to drill into the beam just because auger bits are faster at pulling material out of the wood so it's a faster way of going in. An auger bit is more aggressive, it will tend to pull itself into the wood much more than a standard bit so you got to be careful if you're using an auger bit, don't go too crazy because you'll accidentally go too deep and come out the back side of the beam. Here I drilled a little bit bigger uh, hole just at the shallow part of this hole just to allow for the shoulder of the lag screw to kind of seat down into the wood. And then just because I wanted to make a test trial and make sure that the screw went in fairly easily before I had the beam in place only to discover it didn't, I, I, this, I'm just tightening it in place to make sure it actually goes in. And I have sheared off the heads of lag screws. That's why I used a ratchet wrench going in, but I was comfortable using a socket on a drill taking it out. Because going in is when you might accidentally shear off the head, and that sucks because then you got a piece of steel stuck in your beam. Here I'm lifting the beam back into place. On the left and right, I had pre-connected the straps into giant loop shapes. And I just kind of set the ends of the beam in, and then I went to the center, and I was able to ratchet it up myself. And then one by one, I removed the loop from around the beam, and instead of it going under the beam, I looped it through the little eyelet that I'd welded in place. And ta-da! And I could go to town, just ratcheting it up all by myself. So much safer. So I did the literal heavy lifting with the straps, and then I used the jack stands to fine tune it. And here you can see I'm putting the lag screws in through the holes just as planned. I did discover that as I'm tightening them in, the head of the lag screw pinches at the back of the beam. I'm going to explain that in more detail in just a second here. Alright, so here we are in the last lag screw, and I found something out throughout the course of tightening all these down. So this is the entrance hole that I made, just big enough so that a socket fits in there. And because of the minimal clearance from here to here, I couldn't really drill a bigger hole. So that was a limiting factor. That means on the inside, where the lag screw is popping out the back going into the wood, it's similarly close to this rolled edge. And what I'm finding is as the lag screw tightens and that head is spinning, a corner is dragging on the inside corner here and I'm building up some friction, and that corner is pinching my socket between the head of the lag screw and the top wall here. So my socket's being pinched as I tighten the lag screw, and then when I go to try and back out and get my socket back, the socket was almost staying stuck on the lag screw, because normally they just pop off at the joint here where the extension goes. So I went ahead and I took my cheapest 9 16th socket, and I put two ugly welds on either side. And I would recommend two welds because if you only do one, just the twisting force of this setup will crack that weld over time and you'll lose your socket. But anyway, now that I got this set up, I can put it in, get kind of forceful, really shove it on to the lag screw and not have to worry that my socket's gonna get stuck in there. Snugging up that last little bit there. Now I got a worry-free setup. Of course, I did ruin or unpretty a socket, but it's just chrome plating that I ruined. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll either save this or I can grind those off after the fact. But the good news is, this sucker is holding its own weight now. The lag screws are keeping this up, so I don't need my straps on anymore. Alright, so here we are with both tracks, upper and lower, are in place, supporting themselves. What I did was to test the spacing of them, I cut a little piece of angle iron. And so I can go around and I'll put the bottom edge in the same place 
moving down the track and then look at the top and see where it makes contact. So you can see there, it's right close to the edge of the upper track. We'll move down the way a little bit. A little bit more in. And I would say that's about maybe an eighth inch gap bigger than where I just was. A little further down the way still, maybe three sixteenths to a quarter. A little further down the way still, we're maintaining that three sixteenths to a quarter gap. So I would say in general, there's a discrepancy. The tracks drift apart from each other about three sixteenths or a quarter inch over the course of the entire track setup. Not ideal, but I think that's acceptable variation. So these are the notch wheels I use. And as long as the depth of that groove is significantly greater than three sixteenths or a quarter inch, it shouldn't be the end of the world if there's some variability. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plan on building the doors something about the average gap. This is about the segment I would say is the average of the two since this end is a little tight as far as the tracks being too close together. And on this end, the tracks are three sixteenths or a quarter inch further apart. I'm gonna try and get the, tra the doors to fit between the tracks right in the middle. And then when the door slides that way, it'll be a snug fit and it'll probably bow that track just slightly upward as the door slides into place. And as the doors slide this way, they'll be a good fit for the rest of the track. What I don't want to do is build the doors so that they've got some slack here. Because if you have doors with slack in the tight spot, when you slide that door over this way and the gap increases, there's a possibility that door could just fall out of place. So when in doubt, you got to build the door where there is a gap and slide it into a tight spot, assuming you have enough flex in your system for the track to go apart a little bit. This is what I did on my workshop. I'll probably make a video of that someday, uh, but the concept worked very well overall. And these are the wheels I'm using. I got them on Amazon. I went with stainless. They have a 600 pound capacity. And I took the time to weld in some fasteners so that I don't have to mess around with uh, dealing with this because in the end, I plan on just sliding the wheel into place and applying a nut from the other side. That'll make more sense as we go. So it's time to start building some doors. I'm pretty confident this is one of those scenes where a picture is going to be worth a thousand words and it'll make sense at the end. But what I'm drilling here is the bolt hole for the V-notch wheel. And then I rotate the beam sideways. And what I'm drilling here with my annular bit and the mag drill is a little bit of what you call, I think the term is relief. It's a notch to make way for something else. So a relief for uh, the center point of the V-notch wheels. There's a little bulge in each of them and I had to remove some of the material from this tube steel in order to make room for the wheel. And then I took my grinder and I put the cutting wheel on it and then I cut off this little flap on the bottom side. And once the flap is removed, that is really where the V-notch wheel is gonna pass through the tube steel and stick out so that it can make contact with the angle iron track. Here I'm just taking off the sharp edges with a file because I don't like bleeding. And then there's the V-notch wheel going into place. And then it just tightens on with a nut. And here I'm just demonstrating, even without really a door at all, just the beam slides nicely on the track now. So I decided to weld the doors in place. That makes it a little tricky because you have to hold the upper rolling piece and lower rolling piece in exactly the place you want them. And then you have to put the vertical pieces on and make sure they're truly square. But in my experience building custom steel things, I would much prefer to have to go to the additional work of holding everything stable with weird clamps than to chance the fact that I make the whole thing and it doesn't work. Here I'm cutting a notch out of one of the vertical members, and I'm going to show why that notch is necessary. You'll see that in just a second. But there it is. 
that notch is necessary to be able to pass a socket into the space where the threaded part of the V-notch wheel is and that allows you to take the nut off. So here I'm putting some wet rags that are absolutely soaking wet uh, down on top of the tracks to prevent the spatter from adhering to the track because I don't want to have to clean it up all that much again. In the end I still think I had to clean it up a little bit but I'm trying to minimize the amount of spatter that sticks to the angle iron track. And it's always best to just tack things loosely until you have all four corners done. So I'm just showing the technique and clamping system I use to get everything stable enough to tack things together. I saw this trick on some other YouTuber's channel, can't even remember who, but uh, if you use clamps and just clamp a builder square to your piece, you are pretty much guaranteed it's square. You just got to be careful not to strain the piece too much that you're making because you could untrue your square accidentally or, or bend your square. And you'll notice I took great care to try and cover the V-notch wheels themselves so spatter doesn't stick to the wheel. Up top you see magnets holding this rag in place. I just use those to keep the rag you know, anti-gravity. And you can see here that I left a little bit of wiggle between the V-notch wheel and the angle iron. And then as it approaches the tight spot, it tightens up. So that's about the average amount of slack in the system. With one framing complete, it's time to start inserting the inner members of the framing. And through the years, I've found that even though you damage the clamps, my favorite tool to use is one of these woodworking clamps with rubber feet. They're very forgiving. You can get them to hold on all sorts of stuff that are less than perfectly aligned. Those rubber feet allow you to grip. The only problem is when you're welding, you heat the metal up so much that you do burn the rubber feet over time. So they're, they wind up being consumable, if that's the term you want to use. you, you got to throw them away every few years and buy new ones. And here I'm time-lapsing me building the second door because you saw how I built the first one in much slower motion than this, but I just repeated the same process to build the second door. So, they're working. It sure is tempting to stop here, but until I have time to build the greenhouse that's gonna go here, when I put on my screens and my vinyl sheets, uh, if there's a wind blowing through here, that's gonna put force inward on these big panels of vinyl uh, in the winter. So I think it would be a good idea to put in a little bit of extra support in between these big squares, just so the vinyl doesn't have too much tension put on it if there's a big gust of wind. It's a little irritating because, like I said, long term I plan on building a greenhouse here so there will, someday there won't be much wind coming in from this side because the greenhouse will block it. But that will probably take me a couple years if I'm being honest and in that time I don't want wind ripping the sheets off these doors. So even though this looks pretty nice, nice and open, I'm going to weld up some smaller bars in between just to add a little bit of extra support. Like I said, as I was building these doors, I used weak little tack welds just to kind of hold everything together so it was all squared up and true. 
Uh, and then I took the doors off and set them on sawhorses, as you can see here. And this is where I really went to town and made nice strong welds everywhere just to make sure it holds together much stronger than those tiny little tack welds. And then I put the doors back in place after I had them off to weld them up sure. So I'm basically done framing out the doors and I'm happy with how they slide. So now the next step is gonna be to put some screens in to these big openings. So I took some scrap steel that I had and I cut some pieces, little rectangles and squares, and I'm gonna use these to help me mount the screens. I'll show you how. So for each panel, I'm gonna have a little rectangle or square on the corners and then the screen's gonna come in from this way, go in front of this bar, slide all the way in till the corner of it's behind this, and then when it's in place, the other corner of the screen sinks into the framing here, and that means that the bottom edge of the screen will hit these stops so the screen can't really be pushed out, and then this bar is behind the screen so the screen can't really be pushed in, and then I'm gonna use some neodymium magnets to kinda of hold these corners in place. So it's time to go make some screens now. So these are just standard aluminum framing pieces that you can buy online or in home improvement stores. And they come with these little L-shaped plastic brackets that kind of hold them together at right angles. And this is how you form either a rectangle or a square out of the aluminum framing material. This is an old roll of fiberglass screen that I had from years past when I had first framed in and screened off my porch. I saved it all these years, so I'm just using this. I prefer fiberglass screen because it's more forgiving and flexes more easily if you make an error when you're trying to press this stuff in as you're about to see. So you just unroll the sheet after you cut it to size. And this is called spline. This comes in different sizes, so be sure to check what kind of frame you have because it has to match the spline size. And it comes with this little specialty tool and that little roller pushes the spline into the framing in a way that kind of locks the screen in, as you see here. The other side has a roller that you use to do kind of the final press to get it in there, as you saw. And then here I'm just cutting out the screen once it's pressed into the frame using the spline and the specialty rolling tool. You just slide your knife on the outside edge of that spline and then the scraps just come off. And here I am placing the screen into place just as I had planned and using those little stops to keep it from popping out. So here I basically have one whole door done, and these are the neodymium magnets that I used to help hold the kind of weaker points of this framing set up in place. Here I went ahead and jumped to me cutting a custom shape into a tube steel piece that I had picked up with the rest of the steel at the steel yard. So this serves two purposes. One, it closes off the framing of the door, and two, it also serves as a doorstop. Here I'm marking an angle bracket that I'm gonna to use to screw this in place. And here I'm using a punch, once again, to help me drill holes in preparation for inserting rivet nuts. And that's just a little bit of cutting oil that I'm applying to help keep my bit sharp. So this is one of my new favorite toys. So the thing I'm putting on the end of the threaded shaft there on the tip of this tool is called a rivet nut. And this is a rivet nut tool. It's pretty cool. You basically screw on the rivet nut 
and then place it in a hole that you drilled to just the right size. And in a second here, I'll show you in more detail how that works. So as you pull on the arms of this tool, it pulls the shaft back and that forms a bulge in this rivet. So it's quite literally a rivet. It's just that the center of this rivet has female threads. And so you can pass a threaded shaft into this rivet and pass all the way through the rivet. And as you can see, those vertical ridges keep the rivet from turning. So this is quite literally like welding a nut into a piece of steel, except it's much easier. You just insert this little rivet tool into the hole, pull the handles, and voila. So one of my new favorite toys. I'm going to be using these in a lot more future projects, I think. But I decided to use them to hold the vertical members in place. That way I can remove them if I ever need to, to do maintenance on the doors, and I can just slide all the way out of the tracks. It seemed to make sense to apply the angle bracket, screw it in place, and then tack weld it just to be sure everything lined up. And as above, so below, or I should say as below, so above, I did the same thing I just showed you down low. Well, that's what I did up, up top as well. That's how it looked. Like I said, it serves as a doorstop, and it also serves as a complete framing member to keep the frame a closed system. Alright, so now the framing of the doors themselves and then these permanent side pieces that the doors butt up against. I'm done with all that. So even though it's the dead of summer, it's 100 degrees, as y'all can hear the cicadas buzzing, I've decided to install the clear vinyl sheets now. That way I can have all my rivets in place, and when winter comes, I'll be able to just put them up quickly rather than having to install them for the first time. At first, I had planned on installing independent sheets on each door, so I was going to have two big kind of sheets that are separate from each other, and they would slide with the door. But I realized since this face of the porch over here is ultimately going to have its own sliding door, I have an ingress and egress right here. Why would I bother making it to where these two doors move? So ultimately I made the decision I'm going to actually mount the clear vinyl sheets to the upper track, these permanent side pieces, and then down low to the lower track. That way I'll basically kind of seal in the porch every winter. I'll install the sheets. These doors won't really be usable, but I'll get in and out of the porch through this side door here. Again, I only plan on using these clear vinyl sheets for maybe one or two years until I've completed the entire greenhouse build. That's going to connect over here. And then once the greenhouse is in place, I'll have no need for those clear vinyl sheets beyond that point. All right, so let's get started on that. So one of the first steps of installing the clear vinyl sheets was to cut a bunch of flat stock that I planned on using to help fasten the sheets against the framing so that there wouldn't be excess tension on just the rivet points. That'll make more sense later. And to make these pieces, I had to drill a bunch of holes in them. Sometimes it's faster to just use a step-up drill and a drill rather than a drill press. This thing here is a needle-tipped oil dropper. Really nice. It's a very precise way of applying cutting oil for a job like this. You can get them on Amazon. So I went gangbusters. I tried to drill at least I think it's five holes in each member. And then to install them into the frame, I went ahead and put in all my fasteners ahead of time before I even touched the vinyl sheets. So I put the bars in place after the holes were drilled, marked where the holes should go, and then I used the same step up drill to drill into the framing itself. And there's my handy rivet nut tool once again made this job pretty fast. So basically everywhere there was a hole drilled in one of those flat stock pieces, I installed a rivet into the framing to match where the hole is. So hopefully you get the gist on how these pieces at least mount to the frame. And so here I'm going around just mounting all of the pieces I plan on installing. So this is a giant clear vinyl sheet that I bought online. The thickness is 0.03, I believe that's in inches. The width is 54 inches wide. 
My plan is to use this sheet to enclose the porch. There are two big variables that make this thing shrink. One is that at the factory, there's a big machine that rolls this real tight on a spool. Well, apparently it's so tightly wound on the spool that it takes about 24 hours to fully relax just from the machine. The second variable that I'm reading is heat. In my super hot climate, it's definitely gonna get exposed to a lot of heat. So I plan on pre-shrinking it in kind of a redneck oven that I plan on making out of some oil drums I have laying around. Apparently it can shrink as much as 3% from heat. On a sheet this long, 3% shrinkage would be about six inches, which if you imagine putting rivets in place with fasteners passing through them, and then the sheet shrinks six inches, that would be devastating. It would rip out all of the fasteners and tear holes in the sheet. So even though it's gonna take some extra effort, I'm gonna go to the work of building me a little heater barrel. The luxury of time is on my side because it's dead summer here, and I don't wanna close off the porch right now. I'm just trying to build the whole thing so it's ready when winter comes. So I plan on leaving this inside the little heater for maybe up to a week or two. And just for funsies, I'll pre-measure it and I'll let y'all know the dimensions before and after just to see how much this thing shrinks. Anyone not in America will have to forgive my units, but this is 226 inches by 54.5 inches. We'll see what it looks like after the oven. Two weeks later. All right, for y'all it's been a mere few seconds, but for me it's been two weeks with this thing in the barrel oven and the numbers are back. So the sheet shrank on the long dimension by about five inches, which is about 12.7 centimeters. And what's crazy is it actually expanded on the short dimension by about an eighth of an inch or three millimeters. My suspicion is that's because at the factory, when it's rolled up on that roll, it's actually stretched out on the long dimension, which kind of borrows some, some of the material. So it, it shrinks at the factory and we allow it to relax, it expands. And so while in the heater barrels, it was actually both shrinking from the heat, but also expanding on the width dimension just because it was allowed to relax off the spool. Anyway, so if anybody's following my footsteps, it's definitely worth pre-shrinking this sheet because I lost about five inches in length. That's enough to do some damage. So now the next steps are gonna to be to insert some grommets all around the edges of the sheet. And then I'm gonna use the grommets to suspend this sheet from the rivet nuts that I put in the framing of the door. Let's do that. So here I'm just temporarily hanging up the clear vinyl sheet. I'm using big magnets on top of the upper track bar, if you can see those up there. That's just to temporarily hold it in place while I mark where the rivet nuts are, and that will tell me where I need to punch holes and install grommets into the sheet. Something worth noting is look on the left side, you see those ripples on the one, two, three, four, five vertical strips? That's where the vinyl sheet made contact with the barrel itself at the bottom. My advice to anyone who's copying this is to put like a big board or something underneath the vinyl sheet so there's no direct contact with the hot steel and that should probably help prevent those that ripple effect for anyone else copying this. So here I'm back in my workshop just because it has air conditioning and this is my grommet kit. You can buy these online. So step one after you mark where your hole needs to be is you take this little cutting board they give you essentially you take the punch center it on where you want the hole give it a little tap with a hammer and that pulls a little plug of material out of your way and then the grommet is a two-part system with a two-part kind of uh, press system so you can see here I placed the first part of the grommet into its specialty press and I passed that collar through the hole that I just punched and then you set the second part of the grommet on top so that the bulge faces outward. You take the shaft piece and you tap that with a hammer also. And that flares and curls the shaft of the down part so that it wraps around the, the upper collar. 
and that's how you install the grommet. And you can see here that tension now is much, much more sturdy than it would be if it was just a hole in the vinyl. And so I time lapsed me going around and putting grommets in literally every single hole where there's going to be a rivet nut and a bolt passing through it. And now here I am hanging the sheet back up and I'm installing the bars to spread the tension out over a much larger surface area rather than just having high tension points where the bolts pass through the grommets. I'll show a close up of what that looks like in a little while here. So you can see here if I were to tug real hard on this it would rip at that grommet where the bolt is passing through. All that tension is on the grommet itself. So the whole point of this flat stock, or what I keep calling bars, is that you pass the bolt through a hole in the steel, pass it through the grommet, and then thread it into the rivet nut that's fastened into the frame. And once you tighten that down, that flat stock is held tight, and that tension on the vinyl sheet, if there's a high wind condition or a dog trying to run through it, that tension is spread out over that entire bar rather than just ripping at that one grommet. Here my camera failed because it got so hot. So now we got both the top and lower vinyl sheet in place. I'm sorry, I tried to time lapse me putting this one in, but the ambient temperature here was so hot, all of my cameras kept shutting themselves off. So you'll just have to take my word that it went on about how the top one went on. The main difference is that the grommets in the lower sheet are sharing the same mounting points as the bottom grommets of the upper sheet. And so this bar is holding the top of this sheet and it's fastening the bottom of this sheet passing through two grommets total and it's like that on each bolt on this bar. As you can see here I kind of lapped these like shingles. The upper sheet overlaps the bottom one a little bit so any rain water will cascade down and not flow into the porch. On the edges here I left the loose material just kind of flopping behind this little gutter down spout. To deal with the slack on the bottom I did something similar I just left it for now. If it poses a problem later, if I don't like the way it looks, I can always trim it back, that's easy enough. But I figured for now, all it does is serve to make this thing even more airtight. So here we are inside the porch. The vinyl sheet's on there, which you can barely even see from this angle. It's a lot easier to tell they're there from the outside because there's more of a glare on them. With the doors done, and it being the dead of summer, I'm definitely gonna take these vinyl sheets off right now because it's way too hot in here with those on. And then it's time to move on to the next part of this porch renovation which is closing off this face of the porch. I harvested a door from the house and I'm gonna use that to fill this general area over here. There'll be a sliding door in place there. And then I got a window from a used window store that's going on this side. I'm gonna leave a gap in the framing to pass the chimney through both. I included the details of how I framed around these glass pieces in a separate porch renovation video and that should be coming soon, so check my channel. And I think that's pretty much gonna do it for this video, so. If you found this helpful or you learned anything here today, I would like to ask you to please like and subscribe. That's the little thumbs up button down low and click the subscribe button. That will encourage YouTube to promote me or at least fund me to some slight degree. It will make this all for something rather than just sharing the knowledge with people. Uh, who knows, maybe this will actually grow someday. I think that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks again for watching Suburban Biology. See you on the next one. And while it was in the heat barrels shrinking this way, it was allowed to relax um, from how it, <laughs> this, is, this is such a boring explanation. No one cares. No one cares. Does anyone care about this? No, just me. Just me.